So hello everyone and happy new year again. So one week passed in the new year where probably this is the last day we can say happy new year to each other. So um, and uh, uh, good morning to some of you, Dr. Colleen, good morning. I don't know if anyone else is joining us from the US today. Uh, I would like to welcome our members and their friends to our webinar today. I'm Lina Mikati, to those who don't know me, from the board of the Art Circle. I'm so pleased and honored to start our new season with a unique chance to introduce to you Dr. Colleen Darnell, a vintage Egyptologist and an expert in her field to explain to us the meaning behind all the symbols used in the pharaonic era. Many of us overlook a lot of symbols and inscriptions, and Dr. Darnell is here to enlighten us on the subject. I will leave the full introduction of Dr. Darnell and her phenomenal work to our moderator tonight, whom I'm equally proud to present to those who don't know her. Introducing Dr. Reem El Mitwelli, who is a published author, lead curator, and public speaker. With over 30 years of experience, she's an expert consultant in Islamic art and architecture, interior design, historic dress, and UAE heritage. She's also the founder of the Zay Initiative, a nonprofit UK registered initiative, advancing the preservation of cultural heritage. So uh, before I leave the floor to Dr. Reem, uh, please make sure that uh, you, are all, you stay on mute and uh, write any question you might have on the chat section and uh, it will be addressed in due course. And uh, that's it from me uh, now. And I leave the floor to you, Reem. Thank you. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. And hello, everyone. I think we know all each other, so I don't need to say much about myself. But I'll start with Dr. Colleen, which is a wonderful, wonderful colleague. And we are forging a wonderful friendship uh, that started last year. Uh, Dr. Colleen is joining us from Connecticut in the USA. And uh, she's a world-renowned Egyptologist. She teaches Egyptian art history at the Nogatak uh, Valley Community College. And her um, artistically composed and full of rich content Instagram feed is one of the most popular feeds with over 144K followings. She also has another uh, Instagram feed that teaches hieroglyphics and it's equally popular. And I recommend that you all have a look at it. Through her books and documentaries, Dr. Darnell has brought ancient Egypt warfare and tactics to the broader public. She has published widely in pharaonic history, religion, and literature. Her most recent book is the Ancient Egyptian Netherworld Books, co-authored with her husband, John Darnell, who also is uh, part of her Instagram feed and social media uh, ph um, phenomena. Uh, she was, she, uh, she was, it was the, her book was the first complete English translation of hieroglyphics, hieroglyphic texts within the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings. In Egypt, she has made several important archaeological discoveries as the director of the Mu'alla survey project, an ongoing archaeological project. Her areas of expertise include late period uses of the underworld books, ancient Egyptian military history, the literature of the new kingdom in Egypt, and Egyptian revival history. Her research in Egyptian military history has led to the first recreation of the tactics of the Battle of Prairie. And research and her research on, milita on the military role that Tutankhamun might have taken as a pharaoh of Egypt contributed to the documentary that is worldwide known, Tutankh's Army's Battle and Conquest in Ancient Egypt, Late 18th Dynasty, that was featured in the historical section of the documentary, King Tut Unwrapped. As Lina introduced earlier, today uh, Dr. Darnell will take us on a brief journey through pharaonic symbols. As we know, these were numerous in the life of Egyptian, ancient Egyptians and relied on them clearly in various aspects of their lives, be it social, religious, cultural, or even recreational. It is because of these symbols and their meanings that we have come to understand the history of the pharaohs and ancient Egypt. 
And I think with this, we can, I welcome you, uh, Dr. Uh, Darnell, and maybe we can start our first slide. First of all, I just wanted to thank Lena and the board of the Art Circle because I am so honored to be here addressing you. And thank you, Dr. Reem, for that fantastic introduction. It is so exciting to be in dialogue yet again about yeah. ancient Egypt and symbols. So I'm gonna start sharing my PowerPoint. So today we're going to be discussing symbology in ancient Egypt. And I took the perspective of gestures and the hieroglyphic text that accompany scenes. And we're going to be talking about everything from hunting to personal relationship to children to finally death and mourning before a tomb, before we end with worshiping the gods. So I want to begin with art and writing. As Dr. Reem mentioned, we know so much about ancient Egypt precisely because of its symbols, because of its hieroglyphic writing. And what's particularly phenomenal about ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs is that they write the sounds and the words of the ancient Egyptian language. And yet, even when a hieroglyph is nothing other than a letter, for example, M for the owl, those hieroglyphs are still miniature works of art. So within a single piece of jewelry, like you see here on the screen, you can have both art and writing. And it is those unique properties of the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic script that enables you to do this. So this class here, so this is just a, a piece of jewelry that was buried actually with a princess who lived about 4,000 years ago. And the center sign is actually one of the most recognizable of the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, and that is the Ankh sign, and it does mean life. That is one of the signs that is both well-known and pretty accurate in terms of people's interpretations. And then to either side, we see this loop sign. And this writes the word sa for protection. And then these two signs for protection and the sign for life in the center are placed on a basket. And you might think, okay, they're containing these symbols or any number of possible interpretation if we're just looking at this visually. However, the basket is actually a hieroglyph that is the adjective all or every. So by putting life and protection on the basket, it actually writes all life and all protection. So simply by juxtaposing these images, they can write an entire sentence and yet have a work of art at the same time. So that's sort of the starting point of this unity of art and writing and the fact that pretty much every time you see an ancient Egyptian work of art, there's going to be some actual message, some writing embedded within it. And I want to give you another example of that. This is a scene in the in a Old Kingdom Mastaba tomb. So this is about 150 years, 200 years after the Great Pyramids at Giza are constructed. And this relief is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art now uh, in New York. And what we see here is a hunter. And this is really neat to see this active gesture. We think about ancient Egyptian art often about being very static, that everyone is sort of stiff and posed. 
And yet, if you start to really look in detail at ancient Egyptian art, you see quite a lot of movement and expression. And we see that here, especially with this hunter. I mean, he really looks like he's hauling back on the rope. And what he has lassoed is an oryx. And you can tell in ancient Egyptian art that they were consummate observers of nature. You can look at paintings of geese and other birds. You can look at carvings of antelope and gazelle. And modern ornithologists and biologists can actually identify the species and even what time of year they're showing the goose because the plumage is so specific and they paid such close attention to detail. Now the hieroglyphs up here are a caption to the scene. So these three signs write sepah, which means to lasso. This sign, which is actually an N here, it's actually, it's water for N. And this sign, and then the vulture writes oryx. This means by, and then these final two signs write the word for hunter. So lassoing the oryx by the hunter. Yeah. Normally, when you write hieroglyphs like this, these are all phonetic. Normally, you would actually have a little picture after it. So after lassoing, you would normally have an image of a rope, which is called a determinative. After the word for oryx, you might have a small image of an oryx. After the hunter, you might have a small image of a hunter. But they don't write those here because the scene itself acts like extra hieroglyphs. So the hieroglyphs explain the scene, and the scene fills in details that we would normally expect in the hieroglyphic text. So everything that we look at in terms of symbols and gestures, there's this interplay between the hieroglyphic inscriptions and what's actually going on in the text. Wonderful. And uh, it's interesting, the fact that it is read from left to right. Uh, I wonder, I mean, how, how come, be, I mean, because you have different languages speak in this, I mean, in Arabic, we have right to left, but here you are reading it from left to right, which is very, very interesting to me. I wonder why. So actually, Egyptian hieroglyphs can be written left to right or right to left. So if we look down at this line, you'll notice that the bird here is, is facing to the right. Mm -hmm. Whereas the bird up here is facing to the left. So you always read towards the faces. Oh. And they, they could write in either direction and it doesn't affect the meaning. But as you, you were saying about, about Arabic, the ancient Egyptians also, when they sat down to write on a papyrus and they were just writing in cursive with ink, they always wrote right to left in that. Mm. So that, that too was the, the ancient Egyptian sort of default, uh, but in the hieroglyphic text, they can do it either way. But also you have some hieroglyphics going up and down, correct? Yes, so it can be in horizontal lines, left to right, or it can be in vertical columns, left to right. Interesting. So from the hieroglyphs, I want to talk a little bit more about the symbolism of gestures. This is a stela that is a little bit earlier than the jewelry I showed, but a little bit after the scene we were just looking at. So this is about 2100 BC. And this is a stela that would have been set up in a tomb. So the whole point of this monument is to assist the soul of the deceased. And we see the deceased man here. We're going to look at his wife in, in just a moment. And then all of these people who are labeled as their family. So these are all his daughters mm -hmm. and 
This is one of his sons. This is another son. And when they say daughter, they're, they're actually kind of imprecise about family terms. So a daughter could also be a granddaughter, or they could be specific and say the daughter of his daughter. Uh, but perhaps he just had a very, very large family. And in this stila, we see one son holding his arms out and presenting these offerings. So a cow's head, um, a very large leg of beef, a giant bundle of onions. The ancient Egyptians seem to have been very, very fond of onions. And if we look then at the hieroglyphic text up here, you see a cow's head as well as a probably goose head here. Mm -hmm. And this little plant right in front writes the word 1000. So the sun is making the offering gesture, but then the hieroglyphic text, which is probably something that he would have been reciting, says a thousand of bread, a thousand of beer, a thousand of beef, and a thousand of fowl to make sure that the deceased has everything he or she might need in the afterlife. And what about the sizes that we see here? We, we see different sizes. Is it because of the position of that person in society? So it's the more prominent ones are gonna be larger than the, uh, the others who are not so prominent, correct? That or is entirely correct. And you can always tell who the most important person is in an ancient Egyptian work of art because they are bigger. Um, and I'll actually go to the next slide here. What's really interesting about this stila, and this happens a lot, is that often the husband and the wife are shown at the same scale. Mm -hmm. So even though the tomb was normally endowed by the husband, because men were the ones that had bureaucratic offices and worked outside the home. Predominantly, women controlled the household. Um, and this, this meant something actually serious, seriously economic, because most production took place in the household. But I like how here, husband and wife are shown at the same scale. And we have her name written in hieroglyphs above. So they both are labeled with their names. And then their sons and daughters are shown at a smaller scale because they're the ones making the offerings to their parents. And as you said, they're not the most important people in the scene. And the husband and wife who are the most important are always going to be at a larger scale. And that's pretty consistent all the way across ancient Egyptian art. And can you uh, maybe um, highlight because this is my interest, uh, uh, the dress format. It's very interesting what they are wearing and what can we learn from that? Absolutely. So the tomb owner is wearing a kilt and a broad collar. And it's interesting because if you look at, say, the treasures in the tomb of Tutankhamun, those collars are going to be made out of gold, turquoise, lapis lazuli, carnelian, really the most absolutely precious materials of ancient Egypt. <clears throat> but everyday people could actually make collars like that out of flowers and leaves. So they could just use natural materials to create their jewelry. Or they could use faience, which was <clears throat> very cheap to produce and is kind of like costume jewelry in ancient Egypt, but it could also be very fancy. So just how, I, an example I always like to give is that Princess Diana often wore fake pearls. She, she could wear costume jewelry as, as she went out and about because that way you didn't have to worry about it getting damaged. And the ancient Egyptians were the same way. Even the king could wear faience just because it was easier not to have to worry about something too expensive, <laughs> falling off uh, and getting damaged. The women all wear very tight fitting dresses. And there's a lot of debate actually about how the Egyptians achieved that silhouette in the clothing and to what extent the art 
actually matches what the fit of the dress would have been. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, John and I are actually working on some experimental ways of, of folding the cloth and essentially using a wrapping technique on the bias uh, that gives mm -hmm. you a, a fairly remarkable silhouette that would have been made just out of a single piece of fabric. Mm -hmm. And this kilt down here is interesting because it's sticking out. And we also see that in three-dimensional images. Perfect. And it seems that that was accomplished with starching so that the kilts really would still stick out that far uh, through starching and laundering processes. Amazing. And what I wanted to highlight here, and I'm so glad you asked about the scale because it's the perfect segue into husband and wife being the same scale. And even though they were often equally important in the tomb, there's another way of depicting men and women, uh, which I like to call affection for eternity. <laughs> and <laughs> these two people, uh, man and wife, uh, their names are Memi and Sabu. And they lived about the same time when the Great Pyramids were being constructed at Giza. So I think it's always nice to look at these famous monuments that we all associate with ancient Egypt, but then also look at things on, on a personal scale. And the statue to the right, it, it's not monumental. It's, it's a, I, I can't I do the exact scale, but it's probably about 40 centimeters. I'd have to check the museum catalog listing in uh, the Metropolitan Museum. And in this case, I think the wife is being shown shorter, possibly because she she was. Uh, I mean, we know that ancient Egyptian populations, like modern populations, men tend to be taller uh, than women on average across the population. But I think they've also shown the woman slightly shorter here precisely so that she can be embracing his waist and he can be embracing her. And the difference in height doesn't so much here show a difference in importance, but shows it is a way artistically of creating a height differential in order to express this concept of affection. And what I love about this statue is that it would have been put in the tomb precisely so that this couple can be in this embrace for eternity. And it just, to see that with people 4,500 years ago, no matter how many times I see it, it, it just continues to be so meaningful. True. And if we go back to this image, then you see again, if you look closely, her hand on his shoulder. So pretty much any time you see an ancient Egyptian work of art that has a husband and wife depicted, <clears throat> there will almost always be some aspect of affection between them. And because you had asked as well about clothing, the other complement to that, obviously, is, is makeup and wigs. Uh, so chances are what she's wearing there is, is a wig. Uh, he might be wearing a wig as well. And often what the Egyptians did is they kept their hair very closely cut and then wore elaborate wigs so that you could have your everyday look, you could have your festival look, uh, etc. And this is a mirror, which I love. Uh, so in order to obviously apply your makeup, you need a mirror. Uh, if you're doing your own makeup. And this chest probably held cosmetics, uh, ungans. Both men and women wore makeup and the mirrors are polished bronze or occasionally polished silver if you're talking about royal mirrors. And there are some ancient Egyptian mirrors that have been displayed in such a way where they've been slightly polished and you can still see your reflection in them. So again, this idea of just like, time almost ceasing to exist when when you look at some of these objects. And do we know, um, as you said, I think the, the statue that we just showed, it, it is kept in, a, in the tomb, correct? Yes. 
And do we know why is it kept in the tomb? Just so that they are eternally together? That is the whole purpose or is there more to it? So it is to express that they are eternally together. Statuary within tombs were also like a backup plan in case your mummy got destroyed. So the real purpose of a mummy is to make your body into something resembling a statue that your soul can visit. So obviously preserving the body was important for the ancient Egyptians. But the reason why it was wrapped and encased in a coffin is to create a statue-like image that your soul could recognize and unite with every evening. So by including statuary in the tomb, you are multiplying the number of images that the soul could potentially visit. And often there are also statues of serving figures. So small statues that did the work for you in the afterlife, made sure that you had that thousand loaves of bread that you needed. Now, this idea of serving the deceased is interesting. And again here, we have a woman shown in a slightly smaller scale. She's actually a sister of this man, the deceased. Uh, this is from the tomb of a man named uh, Nebaman. And his sister here is serving him. This is Neb Amen's wife. Her name is Chepu. Uh, and she has the title, it's, it's just out of the frame here, but her title is Mistress of the House. And that's one of those titles that I mentioned about women having this economic power over the household. And then below we have their daughter seated. And one of the things I love about New Kingdom paintings, so we've jumped over a thousand years here uh, to about 1350 uh, BCE. And one of the things I love is just the richness with which they depict the clothing and the jewelry. Here you can see they're wearing bracelets. You really get a sense of the faience jewelry here. And she has these amazing multi multicolored bands. Some of that probably would have been carnelian and turquoise. And she even has a lotus blossom uh, decorating her hair, which is fun. But I wanted to focus on this serving figure, uh, his sister. We know that because it says it right here. Um, and literally from the hand of your sister. And what she is holding, actually I'll start down here. Uh, what she's holding down here, this is a wine jar uh, that would have, so the wine was transported in very large amphorae. And then the amphorae, the wine in there would be poured into these smaller jars, which would be like your wine bottle that you would have on the table ready to serve. And then to drink the wine, you would put it in a small cup. So she's actually offering a glass of wine to Neb Amen. And I love what the hieroglyphic text says here. It says, receive, as in take, take the wine. Here it is. Drink and ear Heru Nefer and make holiday. So mm -hmm. she's saying drink and party. <laughs> mm -hmm. And because this is within a week of, of New Year, uh, again, Happy New Year. And the ancient Egyptians as well celebrated New Year. That was a huge festival for them, the most important festival actually of the year. But their New Year started in uh, what is for us the end of July, early August, which was the start of the annual flood. So they too uh, did a lot of partying uh, during the new year and they wanted to continue that in the afterlife. And that's essentially what this painting is all about. It's about continuing this idea of celebrating life even after death. And that's why the ancient Egyptians went to all this trouble is that they seem to have really encouraged everyone to have as much fun as possible while they were alive. And then they wanted to keep that after death. 
and that's really the the basic function of ancient Egyptian art that we see in in tombs. And because the tombs were in the desert, they survived so much better than houses. We we have very few houses in comparison to tombs in in ancient Egypt, and I think that tends sometimes to skew our understanding of how the ancient Egyptians lived. So I like to bring up paintings like this where you know people are partying and drinking because it gives you an idea of what their day-to-day -day lives uh, were like. But what is the symbolism, for example, between having a larger figure for one daughter and then a smaller figure for the other? Although a rendering of the image, they, they seem to be the same. They don't seem as older. And then you have the breast of one of them showing. Um, what is the idea behind that? Oh, that, that is such a great question. It, in this particular case, I think with the hairstyle in particular, and as you mentioned, the breast being exposed, which sometimes is an artistic thing. Sometimes they show the breast simply because of the composite perspective, where, for example, you're seeing the shoulders from straight on frontally. And you'll notice you can even see Neb Amon's nipple here. So even the, the male breast is being shown in profile. So that's part of the reason for this image in, in the lower right-hand corner of his daughter. I think even though she's shown with the body of an adult, she's probably younger. I would guess she's a teenager in this depiction, probably early, early teens, because sometimes they do actually show children. Typically, if a child is shown under the age of 10, they will be fully nude. And children seem, at least in art, not to wear any clothing. I don't know how much that reflected reality. I mean, very possibly in the summer, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And the, I think she's being distinguished as being slightly younger. And in this composition, because the focus is on the husband and the wife, I think they wanted to make sure that the daughter was much smaller so that it didn't interfere with the larger composition. So I think here, as opposed to importance, it probably has something to do with creating a pleasing image kind of like what we saw with Memi and Sabu, where, where she was smaller so that they could show this concept of affection. And also because this woman is his sister, and we can assume obviously that, that she's older than, than his daughter. Mm -hmm. And then just zooming in, because I you can't get enough of these details. <laughs> And the pleating uh, on the dresses is really, really amazing. And there is even a pleated linen dress from 5,000 years ago in a museum collection in London. And the pleats are still in the fabric. Uh, because again, if that fabric made it into a tomb in the desert, it can just survive in this phenomenal way. Uh, without humidity, materials can stay stable in, in ways that it's hard to imagine in, in other parts of the world. Yeah. And then just moving down uh, to the daughter, because I thought that was such a fun image. So you 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 asked exactly where I was going <laughs> with all of <laughs> with all of these uh, images, and she's holding a big bundle of flowers. Um, so sniffing lotuses, holding lotuses, that is all a feature of uh, ancient Egyptian parties and and festivals. And one of the other really interesting festivals that the ancient Egyptians had, particularly in the ancient city of Thebes, modern day Luxor, was called the Beautiful Festival of the Valley. And during that festival, you were supposed to go to the tombs of your ancestors and eat and drink. You could even write them letters uh, that of, of, you know, that you missed them and that 
you know, if there's something they might be able to do for you, uh, if there's another spirit that that's attacking you. And all of this, this connection between the living and the dead comes out very strongly in their texts and, and images. And because she is shown slightly younger, I thought I would move to symbols of childhood in ancient Egypt. And because this is the art circle, uh, I wanted to make a tie-in between ancient Egypt and much more modern art. And for me, modern art is Renaissance. Um, <laughs> because okay. when, when I study is so ancient, so Renaissance is like very modern, um, very much so. And on in the left here, we see the goddess Isis suckling baby Horus. Horus as an infant. And I'm not saying that Van Eyck here in the 15th century was looking at ancient Egyptian depictions of uh, Isis and Horus. But if you go all the way back to the Roman period, when early Christianity is first developing its iconography and developing the imagery of Mary and Jesus, they hit upon this same concept of the mother suckling the child. And I just think it's so interesting, this cross-cultural milieu of mother and child. And obviously, since this is a reality, any civilization in the world could hit upon the same image. But it seems in this case that there is this direct line from ancient Egyptian depictions, because that was particularly popular in the later periods of Egyptian history. You can see this one is about 100 BCE, could even be a little bit later. And then when you look at the very earliest Christian depictions of the same image, it is shockingly similar uh, to what you have in ancient Egypt. So I just wanted to throw out there this uh, artistic representation of mother and child continuing this concept of, of affection and relationships by going back to children uh, in ancient Egypt. And obviously Horus uh, being a divine child uh, rather than a, a human child. And from childhood and birth, I thought we would go to the other end of the spectrum of life which is death. And as we've seen, kind of one of the points I wanted to make uh, with this entire presentation was the expression of emotion and movement. And we saw that even with the hunter. But here, just to pause for a moment and look at this expression of grief on Again, this, this is his, his sister. Um, sometimes they actually called their wives sisters. You could use the term sister and brother as terms of affection, not necessarily because they were related uh, by blood. Didn't but if you look- to marry each other though as well? Could that be a- That's a really, really good question. And it's weird that we do have it in- royal families. So for example, Tutankhamun married his sister, Anxanamun. And that was a feature of some royal marriages in the New Kingdom. When full brother-sister marriage becomes the most popular is actually after the conquest of Egypt by Alexander the Great in 332 BC, and it's the Macedonian, the Greek royal family in Egypt, where generation after generation, there's a lot of brother-sister marriage. How common that was in the non-royal population, just everyday people, does not seem to have been that common. So royalty did it to preserve the bloodlines, to preserve the dynastic succession, just like kings in Europe marrying their cousins uh, because 
you, you wanted to keep the royal families going. And then again, like I said, with, with the Greek kings, but there doesn't seem to have been a reason to do that among the everyday population. So when we see brother, sister used as terms of endearment, for example, in the ancient Egyptian love poetry, it does not seem to have a basis in actual relationships. But I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that's, that's something about ancient Egypt that is often misunderstood. And it's funny that it's actually because of a foreign dynasty at the very end of Egyptian history, um, pharaonic Egyptian history, uh, that we get that conception. Um, this image of, of mourning, I think is so powerful. So we have a priest here. We know he is a priest um, because his head is shaved. And that was something that the Egyptians did to maintain ritual purity. They would bathe and shave off um, all of their hair, actually. And we, we have a tremendous amount of razors from ancient Egypt. Razors and tweezers are very well preserved um, because again, you, you took them with you into the afterlife. And so the priest here is, is holding the mummy. And then we have the family member, the sister, sitting on the ground with her hand up. And if you look in detail, actually, I'm going to see if I can zoom in here. You can see tears coming from her eyes. And the eye with tears is actually used in the hieroglyphic script as a classifier, what we call a determinative of the verb remi, to cry. And this even relates to ancient Egyptian mythology because in one creation account, people, the ancient Egyptian word for people is remach, uh, which we know from Coptic would have been pronounced Roma. And in the accounts, people, the remech, are the tears, the remi of the god. So it's, it's really interesting that for the Egyptians, crying and mourning itself can bring about rebirth. And, and they say that sometimes in, in their funerary texts, that the, the cries of the widow can bring the deceased back to life, at least in, in the other world. And the fact that um, her breast is exposed here is because that was part of the mourning um, practice of the tradition that women would, would expose their breasts when they were crying and mourning for the deceased. So going from these images of affection and childhood all the way to, uh, to death, and the representations of the mummy. And I just, again, I think we don't associate ancient Egyptian art with emotion. And I think that's unfortunate. So I, I always try to bring in this idea that they very much express their emotions for their spouses, for their children, and for deceased family members. And then I wanted to conclude with the concept of adoring the gods. So we've talked a lot about mythology. Uh, this is Osiris, who is the god of the dead. Uh, he is actually the ruler of eternity, as it says here. So this says ruler. And this says eternity. There's actually two terms for eternity in ancient Egyptian. One is this idea of linear continuity. And the other is cyclical repetition. So Osiris was the linear eternity. And the sun god was that repetition, which makes sense. Um, <laughs> and it was the combination of those two 
that kept the world going every single day. And I just wanted to end with this, you know, really concrete gesture. And you can see both husband and wife, uh, they have their arms raised like this with their palms out. And that is the representation of adoration. So that's praise. That is how you would pray to the gods. And I wanted to zoom in on the hieroglyphs right above his head. So this is the verb uh, sawash, which means to adore or adorations or praise. And these three signs phonetically write the word. Those are like the letters of the word. And then again, at the end of the word, you have this sign that has no phonetic value. It, it's not a sound, but it tells you something about what the word means. And so this word refers to praises or adorations. And if you look at the hieroglyph and you look at the figure down below, you see they're doing the exact same thing. And this goes all the way back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, which is the unity of art and writing. And because the hieroglyphic script is a very visual script, they can reflect writing in their art. So you can read this man as he is praising because of his hand gesture. So the gestures aren't just symbols, but they're sentences, they're words. And I just think that's so neat. Like ancient Egypt is, is one of the very few places in the world that you can do that that you can both write a language and depict something artistically. So do you feel that the concept of two-dimensionality um, gives advantage to expressing emotions or sub subdues the idea of expressing emotions? This is, this is one of the questions that came up now and, and the, uh, the ladies are wondering, do they lend themselves, the images as they are, in two-dimensional format? Are they lending themselves to expose emotion or are they subduing it, in your opinion? Wow, that, I've never actually thought about it that way, but that, that's a really, really interesting question. I think that the way the ancient Egyptians depicted figures in this fairly flat way, I mean, clearly that this, this figure is, is flattened out in, in the two-dimensional art. It's not like we saw with, with the Van Eyck uh, painting. It, it's not shown with volume and three-dimensionality. So I do think that it is more challenging for the ancient Egyptians to depict emotion in this very flat two-dimensional way. And I think that's one of the reasons why we don't associate Egyptian art with emotion is because it does otherwise look stiff. So they have to really engage and put an effort into showing the emotion uh, in their art. And that's interesting because yeah, Greek art, because of its volume and its motion, if you think about you know, the statue of Lakawan and his sons where, where he's being attacked by the, the sea serpents, it's really easy to show emotion when you have the bulging muscles and, and the crying, um, you know, this, this kind of screaming expression of, of pain. And the Egyptians have to go about it in more subtle ways precisely because of how that their artistic canon is. I apologize about the noise. Um, my my two dogs um, were desperate to get in the room and say hello. They were interested to show them, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when, when we go to Q and A, I can I can show you <laughs> the two little the two little dogs that were causing much much noise. <laughs> Another comment that I would like to raise, and that is, uh, it came through the chat box, and that is, when we see the depictions of clothing, uh, we see them in a sort of a, you can see the figure in a silhouette, they are mm -hmm. sort of transparent, so they are, you're seeing the, 
the silhouette of the figure? Is it because to de is this to depict the fact that they are very thin linens, or is it so that there is more symbolism that's coming out by showing the body? I think it's actually both. So mm -hmm. the more expensive fabrics in ancient Egypt, what we know of as the royal linen, uh, was very, very thin. So the thinner the fabric, the more expensive it was. So mm. they're just like they're showing off their jewelry. So, so they're they showing off status. Hmm? So, so it is to show status, in other words. I, I think that's definitely part of it. it mm. It's, you know, look at how much I could spend on my clothes. Um, mm -hmm. And even if you couldn't in life, at least you want to be shown that way in death, right? <laughs> and I think the other reason is because the Egyptians delighted in the human form. Mm -hmm. And I think they don't shy away from showing a woman's body underneath her dress, precisely because you can get that added symbolism of fertility and rebirth uh, in the context of a tomb. So I think the, the transparency of the clothing, it, it's really both. It, it's not an either or situation. This is lovely. This has been really, really inter, uh, informative. And um, uh, thank you so much for the information, uh, for the way you presented everything in a very simple um, layman's term, as they say, uh, as complicated as it looks. Uh, on this image in particular, you have the eye of Horus. And I thought maybe we could end with uh, a little bit on the eye of Horus as it being a very important symbol of uh, hieroglyphics in, um, in, uh, in ancient Egypt. And I had a question within the chat that asked about the nature of, of presenting or the, the idea or the symbolism behind the lotus. Uh, it has, I know that there are many um, concepts behind that, but are they supposed to be Helen? I can't pronounce the word. Um, What's the word? It's uh, hallucinogenic. I can't say it. Hallucinogen. Oh, a, a hallucinogen. Yeah. Yes, yes. The, I, I'll definitely address that. <laughs> so the the eye of Horus, obviously, as you mentioned, is just one of those symbols that we associate so strongly with. Doctor Colin, can you Egypt. go to the other slide where it shows it because it's cut in this one? No, the the one where it was. Yes, I think now they can see it. Yeah. It's the one on the top. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I forgot it was in the lunette. Thank you. <laughs> and what we're actually looking at is the combination. I'll, I'll zoom in. Um, yes. So what we're looking at is the combination of a human eye and the markings of a falcon. So uh, Horus, who could be the human baby that we saw suckling, uh, from his mother Isis in the one statue. He could also take the form of a falcon. And that's what's really interesting about ancient Egyptian deities is that they can be fully human, they can be fully animal, or they can have an animal head on a human body. And it's still the same god. So the eye of Horus uh, was called in ancient Egyptian the Ujant eye, which means the healthy eye. And that relates to the myth of Horus and his uncle, Set. Uh, Set was the brother of Osiris, who we see to the left here, the, the god of the dead. And one of the reasons he is the god of the underworld is that he is murdered by his brother, Set. And then Horus avenges his father. And in the process, his eye is damaged. And then when the eye is made whole, uh, when the eye is healed, then it becomes the Ujjat eye. So that single symbol of the eye of Horus was tremendously, tremendously powerful because it linked into one of these fundamental myths of ancient Egypt. And so it was one of the most significant protective symbols 
because it's like you're taking this whole power of the myth and wearing it on your own body. So um, it, it, it's a really great story. I'm so glad that someone someone asked that because that's such a great example. And and I, I was missing the obvious there. It transcends through time to today. I mean, we, we, we and in the Arab culture, uh, we have it so much. We are so much affected. And it, it, uh, it changed in its uh, content or in the storyline, but it comes from this. And so does a lot of the um, traditions, especially when it comes to death. Uh, there are so much similarities or so many, so many, so much continued um, um, traditions that stem from the, this period that continue to our day. Uh, even the fact that when women, when you said women, you know, expose their breasts, I remember as a child in Iraq, when, uh, when women uh, wailed during a, a, a period of death, one of the ways they showed their, their pain was that they would tear their dress and expose their body. And to expose your body in an Islamic culture, it's unheard of, but this happens during the wailing and it's perfectly acceptable. Just like as you accept oh. a woman feeding a child, exposing her breast to feed a child. So these, these uh, traditions have came, come down through time into different cultures or in the area and influence them. Uh, let's go to the hallucinistic, uh, I can't say the word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lotus as a hallucinogen yes. is, is really interesting. And I have to do some more reading, honestly, to see how much it has been proven or not by botanists because the ancient Egyptians never, as far as I know, and again, medical texts and botanical materials, not, not my specialty, but I can't think of a really common saying or hieroglyphic text that talks about the lotus having any sort of hallucinogenic properties. So it is something that you often hear, and, and even Egyptologists will talk about it. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a crazy idea at all. It could very well be the case that if you sniff a lotus really strongly, uh, you're going to have some sort of um, effect from it. But I, that is actually something I have to read a little bit more to see if you can prove that scientifically. Because the great thing is that you know, the flowers are still there, so you can you can test it. Um, and technically, it's funny. Botanically speaking, I think they're not actually lotuses, although that's what Egyptologists call them. I think they're technically lilies. They're they're water lilies. Um, and botanically, they're different from lotuses. Um, and again, it it's odd that that happens sometimes, where Egyptologists will give something a particular name, even though it's not technically accurate. Um, so that is something I, I will do some more reading about because that's a, it's a really interesting topic. Well, thank you so much for this delightful presentation. I'm going to hand over to Lena and I hope that Lena would be able to go through any questions that anyone might have. I tried to address everything that came through the chat, but um, uh, I need to leave you and I'm so happy to see everyone. Uh, and I leave you to chat and continue. I need to get to another meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Dr. Reem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll take over. Thank you really, really for your um, delightful um, uh, moderation. Uh, yes, uh, Colleen, this, is, uh, this was so very, very interesting. Uh, I have uh, here a couple of questions. Uh, talking about the, your last, probably your last projection, your last... Uh, uh, picture. It's uh, why isn't Osiris not the, not this one, the one before represented bigger than the others? Is it because I mean having a bigger status than the others? Maybe he should be represented bigger, or was the symbol, uh, the uh, the gestures and the symbols enough to represent that he he has a better status than the others? That that's a great question, and I think. Even though the Egyptians show differences in scale, they try not to do it to such an extreme 
extent when they're talking about the gods and people worshiping the gods. So people like the deceased and the wife here worshiping Osiris, they're not being shown, say, the small scale of the servants or the sons and daughters that we saw in that much earlier image. If you look at the representation of Osiris here, if he were to stand up, actually, I'll go back to the previous one, because you can see that a little bit better. If you look here, if Osiris were to stand up, he actually would be quite a bit taller uh, than the people worshiping him, um, a little bit. So when they're showing gods seated, uh, they tend not to make them much higher. Uh, and also because his crown is bigger, they tend to make the figures a little bit smaller to make sure there's room for the crown. So even though there is that overall principle of what we call hierarchic scale, which is that size equals importance in an ancient Egyptian work of art, they will adjust that for artistic purposes. So it's not something that they adhere to really strictly. Um, it's just a general principle and then they can adjust it depending on what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, here there's a question also uh, asking me, uh, why does the life symbol, you know, that was at the beginning of the presentation, I guess, look like a cross? Is there like a specific reason why it looks like a cross? That, this, that was the first um, slide you showed us. Yes, I'll actually go all the way back there. It won't take me that long. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so it's weird. In, de in descriptions of hieroglyphs, you will often hear the Ankh sign called like a key of life, which is just inaccurate. Like, Egyptian keys, locks, didn't look anything like that. Um, you'll also often hear it described as a sandal strap, which mm -hmm. is not. And what this actually is, the reason why this symbol seems to be referencing life. Uh, let me, oh, here, I still have this. Uh, so this is a belt here that would go around the waist. And these elements would actually hang in front. And this was something in the very earliest phases of Egyptian history that men could wear. So you can kind of guess what, what this part's for. Um, <laughs> and because it is associated with something that was specifically for men and for covering um, or holding uh, the front part, that it was associated with life. Now, that's from the very earliest periods of Egyptian history. If you go all the way to the end of Egyptian history, um, what we think about, obviously, still going on. <laughs> I'm just talking about like from what, what I study. Uh, when Egypt becomes Christian in the first centuries CE, first centuries of our era, the Ankh sign is used sometimes in place of a cross. So mm -hmm. the early Christians in Egypt seem to have adopted that symbol to have kind of this dual meaning of life and the cross, even though they were no longer writing in hieroglyphs. Um, but otherwise, for most of Egyptian history, it's just coincidental that it has the shape of the cross. But I think it's really interesting that the Coptic, that Coptic art can use that symbol uh, in, in place of the cross. Fascinating. And uh, a question, a simple question saying that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, the, so, so, some uh, um, pictures are very colorful and some others are not. Were they originally more colorful and uh, maybe the colors have faded or were they originally like this? Again, great question. So this image would have originally been painted. So... Mm -hmm. Typically, when you see a work of Egyptian art that is monochromatic, that does not have the color, it is because it is missing the color. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Normally, reliefs uh, were painted. There are a few tombs of the later New Kingdom, say around 1100 BC, where they're just painted on the plaster and they restricted themselves to black and white and yellow. So sometimes mm -hmm. they do intentionally use a more restricted palette, but normally all of this would have been very, very colorful. And if it's not colorful, it means that it's missing its original paint. Thank you very much, Colleen. This is really, um, really, really uh, very interesting. We can go back to the, I think the last, <laughs> the last slide. And I will conclude this. Uh, it's very, very interesting. We could have gone for another hour easily. Uh, so yeah, on behalf of the Art Circle team, I would like to thank Dr. Colleen Darnell for a very delightful and enriching presentation and Dr. Reem for her uh, phenomenal moderation. And I would like to thank our members and their friends for their attendance. Stay tuned for more of us and don't forget to visit our website and our Instagram on uh, the, the artcircle.ae. Stay safe, stay tuned and have a lovely weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Colleen. And thank you, Reem. She left already. But, uh, <laughs> thank uh, you so uh, much. This, the thank you personally. That was really delightful. Delightful, delightful. Thank you and very much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, I felt like it, it enhanced uh, what I had to say so much. And thank you again uh, for the invitation, Lena and, and the entire board of the Art Circle.